In today's video, we're going to discuss the best secure messaging apps. This comes on the heels of a recently discovered FBI training document that was unearthed through a FOIA request by Property of the People, which is a nonprofit dedicated to government transparency. A FOIA request, otherwise known as a Freedom of Information Act request, requires federal agencies to disclose any information requested under the FOIA unless it falls into one of the nine exemptions that protect interests such as personal privacy, national security, and law enforcement. The findings I'm referencing are from an article I first saw published on a website, therecord.media, which I'll link below. So two things I wanna mention before we start discussing the specific apps listed in this document. First, SMS is not secure at all. Assume any SMS text message you send can be read by your mobile carrier and any government agency. Second, if you were using a phone issued by your employer, this is all irrelevant. In order to protect their intellectual property and security, Companies will use MDM software, which stands for Mobile Device Management. Depending on the software, they can see, record, and log everything. More than likely, when you started your employment at your job, you signed a contract that says they can monitor all activity on company-issued devices. I'm a firm believer in having a strong demarcation point between your personal and work life. First of all, it's healthy for your mental well-being, and I don't want my company email on my personal device, and I don't want my personal email on my company device keep these separate. If your funds are limited, even a cheap Chromebook off eBay is better than using your company device. At least at Google, theoretically, has some rules about spying on you. Your employer does not. So the original document that was released is pretty distorted looking. I recreated it so it's a little easier to read. Credit for transcribing the document goes to the record.media, which they posted on their site. I'll also have a link below for both versions of the document. So on this document, we have nine different chat apps listed along with icons showing a quick summary of what data the FBI can request from these companies. The fewer icons, the better. I'm only going to be discussing four of the nine apps because the other five I have limited knowledge on, and I personally would not use them. So the two I want to start with are iMessage and WhatsApp, not because they are secure or private, but because they are popular. WhatsApp was purchased by Facebook for $19 billion in 2014. Facebook is a publicly traded company. They have a board of directors elected by the shareholders, that are directly responsible for protecting and managing shareholders' interests in Facebook. So what this means is that the choices they make all come down to money. I'm not saying all publicly traded companies are ruthless and will squeeze every dollar out of the market, but Facebook does not have your interests at heart, especially when it comes to security and privacy. They paid $19 billion for WhatsApp. They are going to want a return on their investment. Just to provide some more context, here's the data that the FBI can extract from WhatsApp. I'm not going to read each one of these two because I hate it when people read presentations to me, but there are two bullet points I want to dig into here. The first is the contacts part. Provides address book contacts and WhatsApp users who have the target in their address book contacts. The way I interpret this is that if you have the target in your address book, that's enough for the FBI to get your name and start looking into you. You might think, oh, I just have my friends, this isn't a big deal. In my case, I have some home repair people, landscapers, mechanics, old colleagues, and other random people I've interacted with in the past. I keep them because they do great work and I might need them in the future, but I don't know much about them besides what they do in their professional life. I don't need to end up in some FBI investigation because my handyman went rogue and pulled an Italian job. The last point I want to bring up for WhatsApp is if the target is using an iPhone and iCloud backups are enabled, iCloud returns may contain WhatsApp data to include message content. That brings up one other point I want to mention. The part I dislike about WhatsApp iCloud backup is that it's not just you deciding if your data should be stored in plain text. It's your mom, your brother, your next door neighbor. You are at the mercy of their decision because if they enable those backups, now your conversations with them are also backed up in iCloud. I'm not a fan when my privacy and security are in the hands of someone else. This is Josh from the future during editing. So as I was reviewing this part, I realized it might not have been completely clear on what is and is not end-to-end -end encrypted with WhatsApp. So just to clear that up, WhatsApp recently released end-to-end -end encrypted backups on WhatsApp. So now if you use the WhatsApp iCloud backup that's built into the actual app, this data is end-to-end -end encrypted and is not stored unencrypted in iCloud. But the caveat to this is that if you use the iCloud backup to backup your entire device, this backs up a copy of your phone unencrypted to iCloud, which will include all of your WhatsApp conversations. Therefore, they will be available in iCloud unencrypted. So if you want to secure your WhatsApp messages encrypted in the cloud, use the end-to-end -end encryption built into the app with that backup, and then disable your iCloud backup of your device in your settings. Now let's move on to iMessage. This one is near and dear to me. If you've seen any of my earlier videos, you'll know I moved away from the iPhone to a Pixel running Graphene OS recently. 
after I heard Apple was going to start scanning photo data on iPhones. So let me say before I begin, I think I was using the ostrich method when dealing with Apple over the last eight years, also known as if I don't acknowledge it, it doesn't exist. So as we go through the data the FBI has access to, I'm surprised how well I was able to trick myself into thinking they had my best interest at heart and I was safe. So the first one I wanna dig into is the line showing 18 US code 2703. I had no clue what this was, so I looked it up. This code explains the required disclosure of customer communications or records. According to the footnote on the document, Apple is able to provide 25 days of logs between contacts, but these logs also do not mean conversations took place. It also states that query logs have contained errors. I'll be honest, these logs remind me of some previous companies I worked at where the logs were unreliable and sketchy. It doesn't sound like these contain a ton of personal data, but they also don't sound harmless. So the real vulnerability to the user that's described on the search warrant line is that if you have iCloud backups enabled or messages in iCloud enabled, according to the document, encryption keys will also be provided when the data is given to the FBI, so they'll be able to recover any messages from there as well. I think that since I was blindly trusting Apple because it was convenient, I was ignoring the fact that all my data was vulnerable to law enforcement, even though they always tell you how secure and safe it is. Well, I don't doubt that the data was secure, these big companies can't afford a breach, it most definitely was not private. If you've been considering migrating away from Apple, now is the time. So the two secure apps I want to talk about are Signal and Telegram. I'm going to start with Telegram. Just looking at the document, we can clearly see from the icons listed, Telegram collects far less data than the other apps we've discussed. The only thing they will disclose is that for confirmed terrorist investigations, Telegram may disclose the user's IP address and phone number. No messages, no address books, nothing. So what I do like about Telegram is that while you need a phone number to sign up and create an account, you can create a username once your phone number has been verified. This means that if you want to chat with someone or join a group on the internet, you do not need to give out your phone number. Now some downsides I see with Telegram. The first is that by default, chats are not end-to-end -end encrypted. The only chats that are end-to-end -end encrypted are secret chats. The cloud chat feature does store the messages encrypted in a decentralized manner, which also includes storing decryption keys in a separate place from the data according to their FAQ. This means part of your messages are stored across the globe in various data centers in different jurisdictions, which should make it near impossible for any one country to request data. They also state in their FAQ, to this day, we have disclosed zero bytes of user data to third parties, including governments. From what I understand, the same type of distributed encrypted storage applies to group chats and channels as well. My concern comes with the fact that while things are currently stored in a secure manner, the ability does exist to decrypt your chats using their cloud data from multiple data centers across the globe, theoretically. In all honesty, a lot of companies rely on these super unlikely situations for security, and most of the time it does work. As the saying goes, security through obscurity. The problem with relying on this method is that it works until it doesn't work. The other big concern concern for me with regards to chats not being end-to-end -end encrypted by default is usability. Sure, I'm all for learning a new chat platform, migrating over to it, figuring out the nuances and limitations, but are my parents and friends? With Telegram, not only do you need friends and family to use a new app, but you also need them to remember to launch a secret chat when corresponding with you, and group chats don't have this feature at all. So while you're probably safe without a secret chat, this is just one more layer of protection you need to manually enable if you want to use it. The last point I want to bring up about Telegram, which is something that is usually talked about, is that Telegram was founded by brothers Nikolai and Pavel Durov originally based out of Russia. They were also the previous founders of the Russian social network called VK. Pavel is the majority owner of Telegram and he ended up leaving Russia when he had a falling out with the Russian government. At the time of this recording, Telegram is registered in both the USA and UK as a limited liability corporation, otherwise known as an LLC. Whether the Telegram previous Russian ties deter you from using the app is up to you. At this time, nothing concrete exists that I was able to find that would make this a liability. So lastly, this brings us to Signal. This is my app of choice and the one I've been using daily for years, so I'll do my best to keep this as non-biased as possible. As we can see with Signal, there are two pieces of information that can be divulged the date and time of a user's registration, and the last date of a user's connectivity to the service. So while no data would be best, as far as data goes, this is minimal. There are no phone numbers, IP addresses, or anything that could specifically tie this back to a user that could be given out. With Signal, by default, one-to-one -one chats, voice, and video calls are end-to-end -end encrypted, along with group chats, voice, and video calls as well. This means that every type of communication on the Signal app is end-to-end -end encrypted. This is one of the biggest deciding factors for me. 
Humans make mistakes, and there's no need to have to remember to tell your mom to enable encryption before reaching out to you. The security stance is secure by default. The secure by default also goes back to usability. To me, it's much easier to tell someone to download an app and start using it, instead of also having to guide them on how to use it. This makes adaptability easier for them and makes them more likely to use it in the long run. It's also worth noting that Signal is an American nonprofit organization. Fun fact, Wikipedia is also a nonprofit. Their founder, Jimmy Wales, has explained his reasoning for this in the past as being that since it's for the common good, a nonprofit enables them to do this. They don't answer to ad companies pushing ads on specific pages or biased articles based on shareholder interest. There's a great episode on the How I Built This Podcast that interviews Jimmy, and you can hear more about the founding of Wikipedia. It's extremely interesting and fascinating, and I will leave the link below. But back to Signal, I mentioned the benefits of being a nonprofit provide to Wikipedia. These same benefits also apply to Signal. While this doesn't absolve them of any wrongdoing, it is a step in the right direction. Funny enough, I have the least to say about what I think is the best chat app at this time, and I think that's a good thing. In terms of information disclosed, the less the better. I will end this with a quote Signal has on their homepage. If it's good enough for Snowden to use, then it's good enough for me.